I said, Mom, we gotta, you gotta go to the hospital. Did you call the police? No, I didn't call the police. Why? I asked her, why? She just shook her head. She was so in love, but with the wrong man. My Aunt Helena tried to convince her to go to the hospital. I tried to give, convince her to go to the hospital. We both tried to convince her to call the police. She wouldn't do it. She wouldn't do it. Less than six months later, She was arrested for murder. In a small town in Florida. My grandmother raised me and my three brothers and we lived a pretty humble life. My mother was unable to take care of us because she lived a lifestyle that was not conducive to properly taking care of children. She suffered from epilepsy and drug abuse and she was just out there she was one of those mothers who loved her children, but she just couldn't care for her children. So my grandmother, whom I'm named after, Miss Lena Bell, she took care of us. She was our mother. She made sure that we went to church and we were fed and we were clothed and we had shelter. Even though we lived in a two bedroom apartment, it was our humble abode. She worked as hard as she could every single day. She worked for a fern company, pulling weeds out of the ground, pretty much. It was me and my three brothers. I remember times when my mother would find a place to live and get herself together and get herself clean and, and we'd go to live with her for a few weeks few months she really tried but old demons they always resurface and we would find ourselves back with my our grandmother the most memorable things that I remember about my mother as a child was her cooking she was an impeccable cook. My favorite meal was fried chicken and corned beef hash and rice. Oh my goodness, that woman could fry some chicken. <laughs> Even though my mother suffered from drug abuse, she was still an amazing woman. She had a big heart, you know, a very kind heart. She took care of those people she loved as best she could. She was also a fighter and anyone who knows her would agree with me. I remember when I found out that I was pregnant at 16 years old, I remember her being so upset and so angry. She was hurt. I could tell that she was afraid that my life would end up like hers. And to be honest, I was headed there. When 
when I had the baby, she was pleased to meet her first grandchild. She was right there for the whole 23 hours of labor. She fell in love instantly when she saw him. My mother had a chance to spend two wonderful months with her grandbaby. He was only two months old when my mother was arrested for murder. How was I supposed to tell him that his grandmother wasn't gonna be there for his first birthday? How was I supposed to tell him that his grandmother was not gonna see him take his first steps, but she would only experience them through pictures? How was I supposed to tell him that his grandmother was not gonna be there to straighten up his bow tie for prom. <laughs> there was no way of telling him. The day that I found out that my mother was arrested for murder was a day that changed my life forever. I was 16 years old with my first child and I remember that knock on the door and it was like seven, it was like six in the morning and I remember thinking to myself, who could possibly be knocking on the door this early in the morning? It was my Aunt Helena. And I remember opening the door and I could see the look on her face. I could see that something was wrong. So before she said anything, I asked her, what's wrong? What happened? And she said, it's your mama. And I said, is she okay? And when she said that, my first thought was, oh my God, something terrible must have happened. And it was at that point that she said, your mother's in jail. Your mother's been arrested for murder. <laughs> and I remember thinking to myself, how could something like this happen? How could this happen? Of all the things, how could this happen? I can recall my mother's life and the stories that she told me about the things that she went through growing up. You know, her trauma started at the age of 14 years old and continued well into her adulthood. She struggled so much. She struggled to find herself. She struggled with life. She struggled in relationships. She struggled with taking care of us. She struggled with epilepsy. She had so she struggled with drug abuse. She had so many struggles in her life. And all those struggles led up to her incarceration. My aunt had no idea how to tell my grandmother that her baby girl, her youngest daughter, had been arrested for murder. How could she? That's the type of news that changes lives in more ways than we can possibly imagine. I remember going inside of the house after my aunt left and I looked down at that little two month old baby boy. And I remember thinking, how was I supposed to tell him that his grandmother would possibly spend his first birthday behind bars? How could I tell him that his grandmother would not see him walk for the first time, but that she will only experience it through pictures? How could I have possibly told him that? It was tough. 
it was really tough. I mean, I was still a kid with a kid myself. I needed my mama. I needed her in my life. And that was taken from me. You know, some people ask me, well, are you angry with your mother? No. I'm not angry at my mother. I love my mother. I understand the life that she lived. I understand the struggles that she dealt with in her life. And to be quite frank with you, it's a possibility that prison saved her life. Her life had spun out of control completely from her teenage years on. So, we called the police station and got the particulars. And finally, we were able to get the approval to go and visit her in jail. I remember seeing her face through that bulletproof glass window with the phone held up to my ear. And all I could do was cry. All I could do was cry. And all she could do was cry because she had no idea how she got there. She had no idea how she managed to find herself behind bars for murder. For murdering a man who said that he loved her. Their relationship, the relationship between my mother and her boyfriend was very complicated. It was difficult. It was riddled with physical abuse, mental abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse. She struggled a lot in that relationship. And I, I can recall her telling me that she wanted out, but she didn't know how. There was a, I remember a particular day when my Aunt Helena, she came and picked me up and she said Lena, her and her boyfriend got into a fight and he hit her over the head with a hammer. I remember getting in that car with so much emotion. I couldn't believe what I had heard. And my Aunt Helena drove as fast as she could to my mother. I remember seeing my mother with a hole right here in the center of her forehead and you could see the blood just running down her nose. I asked her, what happened? What happened? And she said, Lena, he hit me with a hammer. He hit me over the head with a hammer. I said, mom, we gotta, you gotta go to the hospital. Did you call the police? No, I didn't call the police. Why? I asked her, why? She just shook her head. She was so in love, but with the wrong man. My Aunt Helena tried to convince her to go to the hospital. I tried to give, convince her to go to the hospital. We both tried to convince her to call the police. She wouldn't do it. She wouldn't do it. Less than six months later, she was arrested for murder. So I asked my mother, sitting across from her, with that bulletproof glass dividing us, with that phone held up to my ear, I asked her, I said, Mom, what happened? She said, Lena, he jumped on me. He started hitting me. She said, the neighbors called the police. The police came out. They took him outside, talked to him, came inside, talked to me. And I told them that I want him to leave. He's hitting on me, he's beating on me. I want him to leave. My mother said the police told her that 
They can't make him leave because he was on the leash as well. She said, but he's hitting me. Because they could not find any obvious evidence that she was being hit, they left. And before the police could get in their patrol cars and drive away, my mother's boyfriend came running out the door with his hands on his chest, screaming, she stabbed me. She stabbed me. She stabbed me. She said, Lena, as soon as the police walked out of the door, he started beating me again. She said, before I knew it, I blacked out. And I remember him running out the door screaming, she stabbed me. She stabbed me. Of course, I can sit here and say, if only the police had did this, if only the police had done that, if only the police had done this. I'm a true believer of everything happens for a reason. I'm not saying a man's life, I'm, I'm not saying that a man deserved to lose his life. But it was either him or her. All I could think about is All I could think about was the day I came over to her house and I saw that gash in the center of her forehead because he had hit her with a hammer. And I was so saddened because she never went to the hospital and she never reported it to the police. All those times he beat her, verbally abused her, she never reported it. We hired an attorney who we believed would properly defend my mother's case. My mother was sentenced to 27 years in prison. I remember at her trial, getting on that stand and speaking on my mother's behalf. I was so young, but I was determined to make sure that the judge and the jury knew the type of woman my mother was the struggles she struggled with in her life. And I wanted them to desperately see how badly I needed my mother, how badly my brothers needed our mother. It was hard. To this very day, it's hard because my mother is still not here. We go and visit her when we can, but it's not the same. She can't hold her grandbaby, her first granddaughter. She wasn't there for my wedding. She didn't meet my husband until after we were married. There were times when I was struggling in my life and I needed my mother. I needed to speak to my mother. I needed her advice. And I couldn't just 
you know, pick up the phone and call her. My mother gave me permission to tell her story. She wants the world to know what she went through, what she is going through. She served over 80% of her sentence already. And we are touching and agreeing and believing for her release this year, 2020. It's time for her to come home. It's time for her to be with her family. She suffered from illnesses, arthritis. I remember one day I went to see my mother and she was, she was pushing a walker. She had a seizure and it was so bad that she collapsed on the ground. She hurt her hip, she hurt her back. She explained to me that, she described to me that lying on those cots that they provide you to sleep on has done a number on her posture, has done a number on her back, her legs, And she's been laying on those things for 19 years. She says when it gets cold, she can feel it to the bone. Medical care in prison is not up to par. I know this by experience because I worked at a jail and I know how it is. I know how it is in the medical department. People are treated, people are treated badly. They're seen as complainers. Inmates are treated badly by the nurses, by the doctors. I've seen it with my own eyes. Needless to say, I didn't stay in that job very long. It was too near and dear to my heart. She needed a scan done of her belly because there was an infection in her belly it took them months to get that scan scheduled and confirmed. My mother struggled in jail. She struggled really hard. Her sleep would be haunted with the face of her lover. He would haunt her for years. I don't know what was worse for her, being hunted in real life by him or being hunted by him beyond the grave. You can never really, you can never really imagine what it's like to have a family member behind bars until you've experienced it yourself. It's almost as if you yourself are incarcerated with them. I always struggle with going to visit her because you're treated like a criminal yourself. 
you're patted down, your belongings are searched. They prohibit you from taking cell phones or more than $50 in cash into the prison to see your family member. Some of the guards are not the kindest of people. Others are very helpful and very kind. I listen to the stories that my mother tell about her life in prison and I can remember a situation just maybe 10 years ago. My mother was attacked by another inmate. The fight was over something that someone said. The other inmate filled a sock with two metal locks, you know, the kinds of locks that you use that requires a combination. She put those locks in a sock and repeatedly beat my mother over the head with them. Repeatedly. I went to see my mother three days after her attack. Her face was bludgeoned. Her face was bloody. It was swollen. Her lip was swollen. Her eye was blue. My mother was arrested in March of 2001. She's been in prison for almost 19 years. My oldest son is 19 years old. That's how I'm able to keep up with the, the years that she's been in prison because my son was only two months old when she was arrested. My mother wasn't there when I got pregnant with my second child, my third child, or even my fourth child. She didn't get a chance to experience their births. And because they were so young after giving, after I gave birth to them, she couldn't see them for weeks because I wasn't able to leave the house for at least six weeks. So she had to wait to see her grandchildren. You can't imagine the pain that she feels She loves her grandchildren so much. My mother talks about her life in prison and how the other inmates band together to support her. They have church groups and support groups. They're like a family, sisters. But there's always two sides to every coin. My mother would tell me about inmates who were mean and hateful, who would talk behind her back and plot to hurt her, plot against her, steal from her. You can't imagine what it's like having a mother who couldn't be there for you as a child and still can't be, with you, be there for you, your own children. I remember as a little girl, because my mother had epilepsy and she could have a seizure at any moment. I remember as a little girl, whenever my mother would leave the house, I would pray for her and ask God, please, please God, protect my mother. My grandmother is 86 years old and she's wheelchair bound for the most part. And for the past 19 years, she's been visiting my mother. As each year passes, it has gotten more and more difficult for her. But she still calls my aunt or calls me up for us to take her to visit my mom. My two brothers, have struggled 
with not having my mom around. My youngest, my youngest brother is four years younger than me and my older brother is two years older than me. And they can attest to the difficulty of having a mother in prison. It's hard. It's, it can be a financial burden and an emotional burden because the prison only supplies the bare minimum. Prisoners require funds to live, to eat, because a lot of the food that's provided for them is less than mediocre. So they rely on their family, they rely on their friends, they rely on the church to help subsidize. They have to pay for medical care. I remember sending my mother money and she didn't see any of it because it went to her medical bill. <sighs> Holidays are hard. Birthdays are hard. As you can imagine, all of my children have been going with me to visit my mother since birth. They visit, when they go to visit their grandmother, they don't go to visit her at home. They go to visit her in prison. That is all they know. My baby, my new baby girl, that's all she knows. She's only seen her grandmother one time. It's hard. It's hard on everyone. My mother has mentioned to me on numerous occasions that the one thing that has helped her through this sentence is her faith. Since being incarcerated, she's given her life to Christ. She's joined faith-based groups in the prison. She doesn't even talk the same. She's like a uh, she's like a miniature evangelist. She's graduated from faith-based programs in the prison. If anyone has a loved one or a family member or someone close to you in prison, I encourage you to stand by them. Don't forget about them. Don't leave them there in that place to fend for themselves. If you can, send them money. Drop a few lines and write them a letter. Send them a postcard, a greeting card. I tip my hat to those of you who have not forgotten about your loved ones, who keep that open contact between you and them because that's all they have. It's important to them. It's absolutely essential. Them getting a letter is like gold. Having money to spend to buy the things that they need and some of the things that they want is, it's important to them. But I wanna encourage you, I wanna encourage those who do have family members who are in prison, keep the faith. I am. I'm believing that my mother will be released from prison really soon. And I can't wait for that day for those prison doors to open wide open. And I greet my mother with open arms. And I have more of her fried chicken and corned beef passion rice. Well, she'll probably be eating mine because I cook it for my kids. For those of you who know someone or who have a family member or a loved one in prison, you understand, you know the struggle from both sides. It's a struggle for everyone in so many ways but you get through it 
You get through it. We're getting through it. Thank you all so much for sitting down with me and listening to my story. As you can see, I'm very passionate about it because I'm very passionate about my mother. For those of you who believe in the power of prayer, I'm asking that you please say a few words for her. That those prison doors be open and she gets her release in 2020. Thank you all so much for watching. I wanna ask that you please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. If you would, please click the notification bell so that you can be notified whenever we post a new video. We post at least one video per week. Thank you all so much for watching. God bless. Bye.